All right. Announcements are over. It's preaching time. You're like, you know, Pastor, I don't, uh, I don't really notice the difference. <laughs> Just kidding. Some of the price. Can you sound like you're preaching in the Yeah, I kind of, I kind of slip it in all different places. <laughs> But I do have a verse for that. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You can't you need to stop preaching. You just have to join me. You can't beat him, join him. Genesis 33. I did let you know last week that this would be a continuation message. Um, the message last week was a complete message by itself. This one is a continuation, though, because it's connected to the message from last week. So last week we preached on wrestling for the blessing talking about Jacob wrestling with the angel and how God changed him through that. And this week, we're asking a question. Here's the question. What is maturity? That's the question. What is maturity? And um, at years, uh, for, for uh, many years now, as I have read this passage in Genesis 33, where Jacob finally meets Esau 20 years after he cheated him. He finally goes back and he has to face the skeletons in his closet and meet his brother. And when I look at this path, it's always blew, blew me away. As I look at this and I go, is this even the same person? And the answer is no. Is this the same person that uh, came out grabbing his brother by the heel? Is this the same, even the same person who listened to his mom and went and put on goat's hair and said, I am Esau, thy firstborn? Is this the same person who lied to his dad and pretended and stole that blessing? Is this the same person that went to off to the land of Syria and planned out how he was going to get the girl that he wanted to get and ended up getting fooled and all the things he went through? A person that put the poplar rods in front of the animals as they were drinking and all the things that Jacob did to try to get things that he wanted. All the dysfunction in his family, like I talked to you about you last week, the most dysfunctional family, honestly, that I've ever known in history is in Jacob's family. Is this even the same person? Because when we read this passage, we go, what in the world? This doesn't even look like the same person. And the answer to that question is, no, this is not the same person. That was Jacob. This is Israel. Now, we still call him Jacob because just like when you get a new name, you got your old name kind of still sticks. But I think there's another reason. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but remember that, Jake, you remember that Peter, his name was really Simon. Yes. And remember how when he first met Jesus, Jesus said, thou art Simon. And, and Simon's a good name. It means to hear, to listen. It's a good name. Of course, it was a good Hebrew name that was passed on from way back in Bible times. And and so his name was Simon. He said, thou art Simon, but he said, thou shalt be called Cephas, which being interpreted as a stone. So Jesus, Peter's real name was actually Cephas. Peter is just the, the Greek version of the, um, of the Aramaic word kepa, which means stone. And uh, Peter, Pet, uh, Petros, is just stone in Greek. All right. And so <clears throat> Jesus named him stone. And yet... Whenever Peter was having a bad day, and when he really wasn't performing quite to the right level, I don't know if you ever noticed, but Jesus went back to Simon, Simon, Satan, at the end of the verse. Yeah. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And after he, de how he denied Jesus, he told him, Simon, son of Jonah. And think about it three times. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And it says, and it says, and Peter was grieved because Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah. He said three times. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus said three times. Jesus, he called him Simon. And you know, in, in the Bible, many, very often, Jacob's referred to as Jacob. And many times he's referred to as Israel. You want to know why? You, every one of us here, we have a Jacob in us, and we have an Israel in us. Israel is the person that God has named us. The person that God wants us to be. But there's that Jacob in there, and that's the flesh. All right. And that's just a reminder that we all have those weaknesses, and we got to do battle with the flesh our whole life. And there's going to be times where we're in Israel, and there's going to be other times where we're in Jacob. And that's just true for every one of us here. So it does call him Jacob in this passage, but he is a different person because now he is, he really has become, I believe, what the Bible would describe as a mature believer. All right. So we ask the question, what is maturity? But I want to say something very beginning, and that's this. Don't listen to this message, what is maturity, to try to figure out if you're mature or not, try to figure out if those people around you, people you know are mature or not. But instead, what I want you to do when you listen to this message is, I want you to understand that what we're seeing here is maturity really demonstrated to us 
Because Jacob wasn't a perfect person, and he never did. He didn't do everything perfect after that. But what we are seeing in this passage is we're seeing that God really changed him, and he really became a different person. And that God wants to do that work of maturity in your life and in my life. And if you're like me, because I was feeling convicted as I was preparing this message. So if you're like me, you're going to have past, as I go through this list of what is maturity, defining maturity from the life of Jacob. I think if you're like me, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to have places where you feel like, yeah, I do feel like God's taught me some lessons here. But you're probably going to have some other areas where you think I need to work on this. All right. So just think of this as a message where God is showing us what maturity is. And each one of us can kind of just focus on ourselves, not think about our spouses or somebody else we know, and just think, you know, God, will you show me what maturity is so I can understand what you're trying to produce in my life? And I'm just going to identify, if there's an area that needs a little work, I'm just going to do business with God today and say, God, this area of my life needs a little work. Will you please change me? Just like you changed Jacob, I believe you can change me and make me a mature person. So Genesis 33, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 16. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came with him, four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel, unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and the children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. What a difference. Think about Esau. Here's his brother who was a taker, who's become a giver. He's already been met with drove after drove after drove of all these animals that are a gift for him. And he's just thinking, is this the same person? No, nope, maybe the same person. The old Jacob would have been trying to steal animals from his brother. He wouldn't be giving his brother all those animals. <laughs> you know, and just if you put it in our language today, it'd be kind of like if a man had a Harley Davidson, and he sent that on ahead, so this is a gift for his brother. And then he had like one of the, a, cu a couple of his really good hunting rifles, and he sent that ahead. This is a gift for my brother. And instead of using them to shoot his brother, he was actually giving to him a gift. Or if he had, you know, I don't know, maybe he had a, a classic, I don't know, 1950s Mustang, and he sent that ahead as a gift. That, I want you to think of it this way because if you look at the description, this was in the message last week, but if you look at the description of all the gifts he was sending, that's what that represented, folks. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of investment. It was his prized possessions. It was what was most valuable in that time. He was giving as a gift to his brother. It was amazing. And so you picture Esau going, what is this? And he asks, what is this? And the person that bring, is bringing the, the sheep says, oh, this is a gift from your brother Jacob. I find grace in your sight. And he scratches his head, and he goes a little farther, and here comes some camels. And he goes, what is this? He goes, this is a gift from your brother Jacob to find grace in your sight. And he goes a little far further, and he finds some cows. And all these cows. You know, my, my brother, a rancher out in North Dakota, he'd probably appreciate this one. You know, for sure, my sister-in-law, would she was raised with cows. Look at all these cows. That's money on the hoof. And he looks there, and what's this? This is a gift to find grace in yourself. But by the time he even meets Jacob, I think his heart has become softened. And he's going, what is going on here? This is not what I expected. And probably even the reason why Esau's coming with 400 men is he's thinking, there's been rivalry with my brother, between my brother and I for years, and he's coming back, and we're probably going to have to fight. Because my brother's probably going to try to take everything I have, because that's all he ever knew, was that his brother always wanted to take everything he had. That's all he ever knew, and tricked him out of everything that he valued the most. And so as he comes up to him, I want you to picture Esau. He's there as 400 men. He's already really letting his guard down, because he's seen all these animals, all these gifts that came. And he looks, and of course his brother's 20 years older, you know. Uh, he's probably a little fatter, like we all get as we get older. Probably doesn't hardly recognize his brother. But he sees a man who walks ahead of his wives and his children. And he bows down to the ground. And he puts his face down to the ground. And he gets up and he walks a few more paces and he puts his face down to the ground again. And he stands up and he walks a few more paces and he does that seven times. I want you to think, what is Esau thinking? This is not the same person, is it? What do you know about Jacob and what have you done with him? <laughs> you know? Who is this person? And the Lord's really working on Esau's heart. And you see that in verse 4. Look at Esau's response. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. They wept. 
gonna tell you something. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. He wants you to get to a place in your life where you face all your Jacobs and no men who are Anglo-Saxon men from North America, red blooded, we don't have to kiss anybody over it. But I'll tell you something. He wants us all to get to a point in our lives where we can have that kind of closure on our past. Where we can have that kind of reconciliation with our enemies. That's what God wants for all of us folks. This is maturity. This is a different Jacob. This is a change, a good change is taking place. There's a verse in the Bible in the Proverbs that says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. This is important, folks. This is really important in our lives. That God will bring us to a point in our lives where we get to a place of maturity, where we can make things right with people, and we can get to be the Israel that God wants us to be, the prince that has power with God and with men. This is important. This is major, folks. We need to get beyond the thought that we're just saved and going to heaven and really understand that God wants to make us into an Israel. Every single one of us, a prince, a leader, someone who influences the world for God. And if Jacob can become an Israel, I'll tell you what, God can do great things to every person in this room. He can. And if Jacob's dysfunctional family could become the 12 tribes of Israel that have their names and the foundations of the New Jerusalem, the walls of New Jerusalem, folks, God can take every family in this room and turn to some prince on and glory. He can. And that's why we're asking the question, what is maturity? We need to get a picture of what God's goal is for us, what his purpose is for our lives. It's not just to take up time till we get to heaven. That's not it, folks. God wants to use us to change the world. That's what he, meant. he said to Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God's got big plans for us, and we have such small plans for ourselves. And when we get a picture, a vision for what God can and will and wants to do in our lives, then we will be willing to cooperate with God when he brings those difficult circumstances that are calculated to make us into who he wants us to be. So verse 5, <clears throat> And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children that I got by my careful planning and scheming. You know, that's not what he said. That's why you need to read along make sure preachers read them. He says, who are those with thee? And he says, listen to this, this is a changed man. The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Think about what Jacob is saying. Think about Esau, his head is just spinning. Is this the same person? No, it's not the same person. Then the handmaids came, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Lisa also with Lisa <laughs> and Leah also with her children came here and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the eyes, in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay. You know, Jacob said, oh, good. I didn't really want to give him the old way. That's what he could have said at that point. Right? If he was the old Jacob. But he's Israel now. He's like, no, you're taking this. You don't have a choice. After all I've put you through. After all I've done. You deserve this, he saw. That's maturity. And Jacob said, nay, I pray thee. If now I have found grace in thy sight. Then receive my present in my hand. For therefore have I seen thy face, as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. You know, folks, a really important step in your walk with God and your spiritual journey and your maturity is where you see the face of God in the face of people that he wants you to reconcile with. That you recognize that your walk with God and your relationship with God is directly connected to those people whom you have wronged. He said, For therefore I have seen thy face, as though I had seen the face of God, and thou hast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee. You notice he didn't say my possessions, he said my blessing. Because he knew that everything had was a blessing from God. 
And maturity, folks, is when you start to figure out that everything you have is actually a blessing from God. It's not yours to begin with. And then you then you're much more willing to share with others because you know that it's not yours anyway. He says, Take I pray thee my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt gracious with me, graciously with me, and because I have enough. Think about that. Jacob, who's grabbing the heel, who's stealing things, who's lying and cheating, who's trying to figure out any way he can to get more. He says, I have enough. That's not Jacob anymore, it's Israel. And he urged him, and he took it. And he said, let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. This is Esau talking to Jacob. And he said unto him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly. According as the cattle that goeth before me and the children are able to endure until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. Heavenly Father, I ask that today as we look into your word and we ask the question, What is maturity? that you will show us clearly, Father, the kind of people that you want us to be. And Father, I praise you for your work. I praise you for your patience. Just like you spent 20 years working in the life of Jacob and all the hardship and all the difficulty and all the disappointments and all the losses that he experienced. And yet, Father, through it all, you were making him into a completely different person. And Father, I pray that we as well, as we study this passage, that we'll understand what we're going through in our lives. And we'll see that you want to change us from a Jacob into an Israel. And Father, that your goal, the Bible says, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That his goal is to make us like Jesus Christ. And even Jesus Christ, it says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And Father, if our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, went through suffering, to learn obedience, we are going to have to do the same thing. So, Father, will you encourage and strengthen us today? And will you put deep in the heart of every person in this room a desire to be a mature believer? Father, that will help us so much in our lives. Will you open our eyes and teach us in Jesus' name? Amen. What is maturity? Number one, maturity is humbling yourself. And this is found in verse 3 of our text, where it says, He passed over before them, and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So number one in this passage, what we see is maturity is humbling yourself. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about humbling ourselves. And it's not just about humbling ourselves before God. It's about humbling ourselves before other people. And it's a sign of maturity. And you see that in Jacob's life where he was so proud. He was so arrogant. He was such a conniver, such a schemer, always trying to get for himself, always trying to make himself more important. And you see a changed man who comes before his brother, his older brother, no less, because I understand that because I have an older brother, his older brother, and he bows himself to the ground seven times before his brother. He humbled himself. Maturity is humbling yourself. I want to show you some passages of Scripture in the Bible that emphasizes humbling ourselves with one another, not just before God, but with one another. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, if I pause there, we would go, yes, preach it, Brother Hunter. Christians nowadays aren't living for God, and we need to walk worthy of the vocation or of the calling we're called. Bless God, we need to get back to the straight and narrow path of right and wrong. Amen. Preach it. We need to walk worthy. And I say amen back to you, but then he says what it means to walk worthy. And the very first thing he says is this, with all lowliness and meekness. Wait a minute, walk worthy, yes, walk worthy. And you know how you walk worthy of your calling? Is to be humble, is to humble yourself, to make yourself less important, to make yourself of no reputation, like your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did when he came from heaven's glory and laid aside all of his glory, and he humbled himself and was obedient to the death of the that's what he did. And that's what God calls the vocations to be like Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, walk worthy of the vocation. And it doesn't mean 
this in this passage, walking worthy vocation doesn't mean memorizing the Bible. It doesn't mean uh, um, uh, looking good in public like a super Christian. It actually means humbling ourselves. That's a sign of maturity. See, we don't think of that as maturity. We think of that as kind of a demeaning of ourselves. But the Bible says that's the sign of maturity. And you see that in Jacob. The first thing you see in this passage meet Esau is he bows himself to the ground seven times. And so humbling ourselves is so important. It says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Folks, when I look in the Bible, I see a lot of really messed up people. And for, quite frankly, I'm really shocked at how God could use all those people. But you want to know why I get shocked? By the way, when you find something in the Bible that shocks you, you better pay attention to it because you're going to learn something. If you just pay attention to the box of the Bible, you understand the parts you don't understand, you just kind of skip over them. You're going to miss everything God wants you to know because the stuff that you already understand, you don't need to learn that. You need to learn stuff you don't understand. right? And so when you look at a passage or something in the Bible and you don't get it, how was God able to use all those messed up people? I don't know. That's weird. Oh, well, and go on with my life. Folks, you just missed the most important lesson you need to learn in the Bible. And I'll tell you something. When you look at the people that God used in the Bible, you are shocked at how many of them were dysfunctional how many of them made terrible choices and ruined their life. And we're going to talk about someone next week. People who ruined their life, who did terrible things. And you're going to say, how in the world could God use that person? And the answer is this. That person humbled themselves. That person humbled themselves. And because that person was humble, God is able to use them. It is so important. In this passage, when it talks about humbling yourself, it says this, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I want to tell you something. Do you know what will be the difference between where the Dallas Baptist Church is a church that is shining light in this community, blessing everyone, unified, like next week we're going to have a, a, a business meeting, and we're going to work toward unity in the decisions that we make, and unity doesn't mean that you all have to do what I say. That's not what unity means. Unity means that we have to all together agree on what does the Word of God say. All right, And there are times where I will change my opinion because I'll say, hey, the Word of God doesn't line up with what I used to believe. I changed. Now I believe this. We all have to be open to changing and lining up our lives with the Word of God. And But I want to tell you something. You know what would be the number one way that God could make Dells Baptist Church a place where people come and they feel something different and they feel drawn closer to God and they have a desire to change and where people in the community will be transformed? It is if we humble ourselves. Because it says in this passage, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. You know, unity comes from humility. Because when I walk into church, if I'm setting aside my own goals and my own way to do God will in His ways, and every single other person's doing that, we come in and we're not going to do it perfectly. Of course, we're, we're following human beings. But when we make that our goal to humble ourselves, I'll tell you something. There's unity there. And it's the unity of the Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit can work. Because we've all given up our own desire to be important, to be heard, and we've given up our desire to have our way, and we're saying, God, what do you want for Dallas Baptist Church? And we find it in the pages of Holy Scripture. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the of peace. So in that first verse, you see there that there's unity in humility. But then Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says this, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And I'm very aware, folks, that I need to grow in this area. I need to learn to be humble, to humble myself. Maturity is humbling myself. And the Bible says that. It says in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So um, humility not only brings unity, but humility brings a, a, an ability to get along with people and not have that strife and vain glory. But I, I am in lowliness of mind. I'm actually thinking that other person is better than me. And I, you know, there's some people that just do that better. I know some people. I, I know my wife is one of them. I don't know some people. If they just naturally think more highly of other people than themselves, then I praise the Lord for those people. I wish I was that person. I have to work at that all the time. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Now, Cordell is another person I can just think of right off the bat, okay? Um, where he really naturally does think high, more highly of other people than himself. That's wonderful. That is a great quality. My wife's the same way. And I'm not, I hope I didn't miss anybody. Those are just a couple people that come to my mind. I'm just talking about one thing here. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. Where I just, I admire that in them. I just think that's what God says. Think of other people as better than you. So important. So needful. I praise the Lord for people like that. And I want to be that person. I want to become mature, become that person. Humble myself. And, and the way that we avoid the strife is that we consider someone else better than me. And I will just tell you this. One of the things I've learned about that, what helps me with that struggle, is focus on your own faults and don't focus on other people's faults. 
When you focus on other people's faults, you will naturally feel like you're superior to them. But when you focus on your own faults, you will tend to feel that they are better than you. So that's just a thing here. I don't mean focus on to be depressed. I mean focus on your faults to work on. To say, okay, God, I know these are some areas where I struggle, and God, will you help me with that? And if you're thinking about that less than you are thinking about and talking about someone else's faults, you will tend to put yourself below them and them above you. And that is a very important way to avoid strife. But then uh, uh, Colossians 3, 12 through 13 says this, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. I was talking about bowels of mercies. It is the word, actually, your inner organs, all right? And that's an important translation to actually translate that. So we in English know that in the Greek it really is saying it's your inner organs. It's how you feel on the inside, all right? So bowels of mercy has to do with the feeling, that compassion, feeling what other people are going through. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. You see, in that passage, it says humility brings forgiveness. You know that? Do you know that unforgiveness is pride? Un at the root of all unforgiveness is the perception that my sins are not as bad as someone else's because Jesus Christ has forgiven me. And I gladly accept that, oh, thank you, Jesus, forgive me, and I'm never going to forgive that person. Really, that's pride. And so forgive, the humility brings forgiveness. It says, humbleness of mind, and it says, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Maturity is so important. And when we see in churches, anger, bitterness, I'm not talking about our church, but this does come up, this does happen in churches. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. You know what that's it? What's going on there? There's a lack of maturity, and there's a lack of humility in that church. And I pray that God will produce that maturity in us Maturity is humbling yourself. And then one more verse, 1 Peter 5, 5. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And that's the last thing about humility is that humility brings grace. I don't know about you, folks, but I need God's grace every day. I need God's grace when I get up in the morning. I need God's grace when I talk to my wife. I need God's grace when I talk to my children. I need God's grace when I get in that car and drive to, to work. I need God's grace. Oh, I really need God's grace at work. You know, I need God's grace everywhere. God doesn't give me grace. I'm not fail. And the Bible says, God resisteth the proud, give it grace to the humble. Humility brings grace. Humility is so important, and it is underemphasized in our Bible studies, and it is underemphasized in our churches. And we need to get back to understanding that number one in this passage in humility is humility is humbling yourself. But then number two, maturity is attributing success to God. Not only is maturity humbling yourself, but maturity is attributing success to God. I want you to look at verse 5. He lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Maturity is attributing success to God. You know, especially as men, this is a lesson we need to learn. And that is, if you are an able-bodied, strong, intelligent man, and you work hard, and you provide for your family, or you build something, or you fix a car, and all those things that you do, whatever it is, or you're a fearless leader, or whatever it is that you picture yourself as a man, whatever accomplishments you've made in life, if you're a Jeff Bezos who built the greatest, biggest company in the world, Amazon, and all those kinds of things, and you're the richest man in the world because you're worth $100 billion, whatever it is that you've accomplished, you need to remember something. God is the one that gave you the ability to everything. It all comes from God. You know, when you started out, you were nothing. Then you go far enough, we started out as dirt. <laughs> all right? We're nothing. Everything comes from God. And Jacob became a mature person who didn't say, I did this, I got that, I was really smart, I worked really hard, and I got all this stuff, and I got these children, and I got these wives. He didn't say that. He said, the children, which God hath graciously given us. He recognized that what he, his success, what he had been successful in was from God. Maturity is attributing success to God. Whatever it is that you're good at, whatever it is that you, whatever area you give success in life, you need to always say God is the one to do it. And not just say it, but really believe it. Maturity is attributing success to God. If there's any part of me that thinks I did anything, I'm not mature yet. I'm not mature yet. Maturity is attributing success to God. I want to show you some verses in the Bible where some of God's servants attributed their success to God. First of all, Genesis 32.10, which we actually read last week, he's praying to God. And Jacob is, before he meets Esau, and he says this, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. Genesis 41, 16, this is Joseph speaking to Pharaoh. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. 
God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know, if there's anything God's told, taught me in the last four years of pastoring is this. It's not me. <laughs> it's not me. I even shared with Mr. Hansen recently that, oh, it was actually last fall. I had a time, I don't remember when it was, I think I was at another pastor's meeting. I was listening to some other pastors preach, I don't know. But you know what God showed me? He showed me that I'm not a good preacher. He did. And you can disagree with me, and that's okay. I'm telling you anything. He said, well, I think you're a great preacher. I said, that's good. I'm not going to try to talk to you out of that. I don't know what you think I'm a bad preacher. But God really showed me that I am not a good preacher. And that helped me. You know what I realized? Anything good that happens in this congregation is God. It's not me. Amen. That was wonderful. I needed to learn that. And you know what else? All the problems I've been through and all the problems all of you have been through and all the things we've been through the last four years, you know what? I realized everything that happened, if there was any success, if there was any person that got saved, if there was any marriage that improved, if there was any you know, larger attendance we had in church or any success at all or in our finances, whatever, any success, Mr. It wasn't me. It was all a gift from God. It had nothing to do with me. Nothing at all to do with me. In fact, you can say, well, if you were obedient, it had to do with you. You know what the Bible says you're supposed to do? Jesus said, when you have done all these things that are commanded you. Wait, I haven't even done all the things that are commanded you. He said, when you've done all these things commanded you, here's what you say. We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Right. You know, that's just your duty. So even if you've done all the things that are commanded you, which, by the way, no one in this room has. But even if you have, you know what you're supposed to say at that point? Well, that was just my duty. <laughs> I don't get any credit for doing my duty. He said, when you when a servant goes out in the field and comes in, and, and he says, it, does he tell him, oh, you sit down and I'll cook for you? No, then he has to come. After he came back from the field, he has to come and he has to cook for his master. And then when his master's all done eating, because he's the servant, he's the employee. And when he's all done eating, then, then the master gets up and leaves, and then the servant can eat. And he said, and even so, when you've done everything that's commanded, you say, oh, I just did my duty. I'm an unprofitable servant. I just did my duty. And we need to get to a point where we realize everything good that happens in our lives, every victory, every success, it's God. And not just say it, but really believe it. Really believe it. Journey is attributing success to God. I want to show you um, Acts 3.12 as well. We just studied this in our men's Bible study on Saturday nights. We come set up church and we do a Bible study. Mr. Hansen's leading a Bible study in the book of Acts. We just studied this. And when Peter saw it, he answered the people. This is right after the, the lame man was healed. Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power of holiness we had made this man to walk? You know, something amazing happens, some miracle, some great answer to prayer, like we're hearing the Hanson share in our Sunday school time. You know, you don't, don't look at the person as no. if by their own power of holiness. No, it's God that did the whole thing. We all have to remember that. Maturity is attributing success to God. It says, why look ye so earnestly on us? I gotta tell you something. Don't look earnestly on your pastor. Because anything that he does, or anything that happens connected to his ministry, is not his own power, and it's not his own holiness that does that work. It's God. Maturity is attributing success to God. So number one, maturity is humbling yourself. Number two, maturity is attributing success to God. Any success in your life attributes to God. And understand it really did come from God. Number three, Maturity is making things right with people. Um, in verse 8, he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. You know that Jacob was not sending all those droves of animals to impress Esau. That's not what he was doing. He's doing to find grace in his life. He was doing to make things right with him. You know, that is such an important point. I can't emphasize that enough. The Bible emphasizes that we need to make things right with people. If there is something between you and someone else, you need to make it right with them. And that's maturity, folks. Maturity is getting to a point in our lives where we go, you know what, my own pride and my own self-respect and how I look, that does not matter. My public image does not matter. What matters is that any person that has anything against me, even real or perceived, that I would make things right with that person. That's maturity. And Jacob had come to that point. He said, these are to find grace. You know, he could have said, huh, you know, you didn't even care about your silly, you sold it for a pot of mess of pottage, right? You didn't even care about the, the right of the firstborn. Why would you have sold it to me? You're the idiot. You wrecked your own life with your own choice. And then, well, well, it wasn't my fault that I stole your blessing because the Bible said the older shall serve the younger, so it was out. It was predestined. 
And so, hey, it was mine. I don't need to apologize for that. And anyway, my mom made me do it. My mother said, obey my voice, my son. So my mom is the one that made me do it. And anyway, I had to run away from you because you wanted to kill me. And I didn't get to see my mom for 20 years. And it's all your fault. And he could have flipped the whole thing around if he wanted. Because plenty of victims today would have done exactly that. But you know what he said? These are defined grace in the sight of my Lord. Maturity is making things right. I'm going to show you a couple of verses. Matthew, 20, Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gifts to the altar, and there rememberest, there, right at the altar. You know, God has a way of bringing things to our mind at the certain spot in our lives. He says, if you bring a gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath fought against thee. Jesus is talking to the Jews when they bring their gift to the temple, probably when they're bringing their peace offering, okay? He says, leave there thy gift before the altar. Say to the Levite, hey, um, this is my sheep that I'm going to offer for a peace offering. Those of you that are studying with us on Thursday nights, talking about the peace offering and the dress back up. Here, here's my sheep. Will you hold it? Here. Um, I'm going to tie it in the corner here. Leave my sheep alone. i got to go do some business with God. I'll be right back. And the sheep, they write something. Okay. So he ties off your sheep. It's sitting there all that, and that, waiting to die. And you go off. <laughs> and you make things right. And you come back. And then you offer your gift. That's, what, that's how important God considers your relationship with other people. And people who wrong you. People you wrong. Making things right. Everything in your power. We're going to get to that. Everything in your power. Sometimes that other person won't reconcile with you. That's not your problem. As long as you've done everything in your power to reconcile with them. It says, and leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. Then come and offer thy gift. That's how important it is. That even if you're in the middle of offering a gift at the altar, that you would leave your gift, go be reconciled, then come back, offer your gift. That's how important it is. You can't even wait and do the offering and then go. Jesus said, do it first. Do it first. That's how important. Maturity is making things right with people. Making that a priority in your life. Instead of having your list of grievances that you nurse, instead the opposite, that you're going back to the people that you've wronged over the years, and you're asking them to forgive you, and you're trying to reconcile with them. The exact opposite of what human nature does, which is, I've got my list of how everybody's offended me. Instead, I need to have my list of how I've offended other people, and I need to go back and make things right with them. That's what the Bible teaches to do. And again, just do everything in your power to make things right. If they don't want to make things right with you, that's not your problem. You took care of your side of it. You've forgiven them. You go try to make it right. They don't want to. Don't worry about that. Pray for them. Leave God's hands. Go on with your life. Go back and offer your gift. But then there's one more verse, Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, that verse said, live peaceably with all men. It'd be an impossible commandment. There'd be no way to obey it. Could, in fact, Jesus said, I come to be bring peace, but of Lord. And there's a lot of places in the world that as soon as you trust Christ, you are instantly not at peace with everybody you know, especially if you come from a Muslim uh, Muslim family or something. But he didn't say to live peace with all men. He said, if it be possible, if it's actually possible for you to do something to bring peace, and it says, as much as life in you. Everything that's in your power, you need to do, live peaceably with all men. So what is maturity? Maturity is humbling yourself. Maturity is attributing success to God. Maturity is making things right with people. And then number four, maturity is being a giver instead of a taker. Maturity is being a giver instead of a taker. I want you to see what it says in verse 11. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. That's amazing. Jacob was a taker before. He came out as a taker, hanging on to the heel, right? He was always taking things from his brother, and instead he pushes him and pressures him to take it, to take it. And so he's giving, he's a giver. Jacob went from being a taker to a giver. Folks, we are $20 trillion in debt as a country right now because we're a nation full of takers instead of givers. Did you know that? Because we are so obsessed with getting government programs and things from the government that we don't care if we are mortgaging our children's future and destroying our entire economy at some point will be destroyed by all of our spending. We don't even care about anybody else except ourselves, and we will vote for the person that will send us the biggest check. We're destroying our country right now. God doesn't have to judge us. We're judging ourselves. Because we're a nation of takers instead of givers. We're a nation of takers instead of givers. And that's okay for, I mean, it's not okay, but that's going to be the reality for unsaved people for the world. But God wants his people to be mature and to not be takers, to be givers instead. And Jacob changed from a, a taker to a giver, and he says, he urged him, and he took it. He urged him. That's how passionate Jacob was about giving, about giving. Charity is being a giver instead of a taker. I'm going to show you some verses about that. Acts 20, 35. I have showed you, the Apostle Paul says this. 
I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And in Matthew 20, verse 28, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of Man didn't come to be ministered unto, and to give, and to give, and to give. Jesus Christ came to give. And when we become mature, in the image of Jesus Christ, we will become givers and not takers. Maturity is becoming a giver, being a giver instead of a taker. All right, maturity is humbling yourself. Maturity is attributing success to God. Maturity is making things right with people. Maturity is being a giver instead of a taker. Number five, maturity is being content. Maturity is being content. Look at verse 11 again. He said, Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. I had all of my <laughs> points for this sermon um, a couple of years ago. And as I was studying this verse this week, for those of you that like short sermons, sorry. But as I was studying, <laughs> God showed me two other things about maturity as I was studying this verse, this passage. And that part jumped out at me. I have enough. Wait a minute. Jacob said I have enough? What? Is this Jacob? No, it's Israel. I have enough? Yeah. Maturity is being content. Oh, folks, I don't care how long you've lived in this world. If you haven't learned contentment, you are not mature. If you are 95 years old and you have not learned how to be content in all circumstances, I know you ladies are studying this in your Bible study. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I want you to know something, folks. That's maturity. Attorneys being attended. If you're 95 years old and you've been a church member for 70 years, if you're not content, you're not mature. If you're not content, you're not mature. And the Bible says, I have enough. I want to show you some verses about contentment in the Bible. Luke 3, 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, the soldiers that came to be baptized by John the Baptist, all right? Here's what they said. And saying, what shall we do? And he said unto them, here's what he told the soldiers. He says, resign from the military because the military is not God's will for you. Oh, oh wait, that one must be this Mennonite standard version. No, that's not what he told them, the soldiers. He said this three things to them because did you know that God said, the Bible says that the, the government is the minister of God who bears the sword? Did you know that those soldiers... When they were soldiers for the Roman Romans, they were actually serving God. It's in Romans 13. Go study it. It says they're ministered of God when they bear the sword. All right? So a soldier who bears a weapon of, of death is serving God, according to the Bible. Study it out. That's a different message. I won't preach it today. But that's what they're doing. And so he did not tell them to lay down their arms and quit fighting for the evil, demonic Roman government. He didn't say that. Here's what he said. Do violence to no man. In other words, don't be, don't be violent toward people. That's not part of your job to keep law and order in the Roman Empire. Neither accuse any falsely. Make sure that when you do discipline somebody, when you deal with the situation, that the person is really guilty. And then he says this, and be content with your wages. You know there's all kinds of people who are pacifists and don't believe soldiers should fight, who aren't content with their wages. Isn't that ironic? They're looking at a passage like this, and they're telling everybody, you're not supposed to fight. Soldiers aren't supposed to fight. And yet the passage is actually saying, be content with your wages, and they're not content with what they're getting paid. It's amazing how we take the word of God and we twist it to something that's the opposite of what he's saying. But he said, be content with your wages. And folks, the Bible commands us to be content with our wages. Whatever you're getting paid, you need to be content with your wages. Now, you are free to go and, and work a different job or apply for another job, yes. But when you get to that job, you need to be content with your wages. The Bible commands us to be content with our wages. It's a terrible testimony. Christian to be greedy for more and more money and never be content with their wages. Philippians 4, 11 through 13, not that I speak in respect of one. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I want you to know something. Philippians 4, 13 is a common verse. All right? And it's a good verse. And people usually use it like, oh, I'm facing this really difficult situation, but I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Now, by the way, that's true. So if you're going to use that verse out of context and say, whatever challenge I face, I can do it through Christ who strengthens me, hey, go ahead. 
because it's still that true. That's still true. It's not really what that verse is saying, but it's still true. Any challenge you face, you can do it through Christ who strengthens you. But I want you to know what actually Philippians 4.13 is saying. You just read it. It's saying I can be content in all circumstances if Christ strengthens me. That's actually what Philippians 4.13 is saying. So I want to tell you something. If you use Philippians 4.13 to make yourself feel better about a challenge that's coming, but if you are not content, you are actually using Philippians 4.13 completely opposite. You need to be content in all circumstances. And then if you're struggling with contentment, you need to quote that verse. I can do all things. I can be content in all circumstances. That's what Paul is actually saying, Philippians 4.13. Again, it's okay to use it for those other reasons. But if you're using it for those other reasons, some challenge you face, and you're missing the message of contentment, and you're not a content person, you are actually violating Philippians 4.13 while you quote it. Just wanted you to understand that. So, the Bible says we need to be content in all circumstances. Full, hungry, abased, abound, everywhere in all things, abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Contentment is so important. Maturity is being content. And then 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we run nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. The Bible says, if you've got food, you've got clothes, you're fine. That's what the Bible says. Now again, it's not for sin to have more than food and clothes. I have a lot more than food and clothes. But the Bible says, if you have food and you've got clothes, you're fine. You really can be content with that. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. How much more, by the way, should we be content if we have more than food and clothes, right? Since we all do, we really have no excuse for not being content, because the Bible says, if we just have food and clothes, we can be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. When your goal is to be rich, you are putting yourself in a path of temptation and into a snare. The devil's going to grab you, because your priorities are wrong, you're not content anymore, you're not mature because you're trying to get more and more and more money. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is, you're going to hurt yourself if you're not content. And that's why maturity is being content. And then Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be, or your lifestyle be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now here's another example, just like Philippians 4, 13, a passage we always quote, and I even quote it a lot of times, I'm preaching nursing home, Jesus is always with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And it's true, you can use it for that. Remember Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. Psalm 139, if I go up into heaven, you're there. If I go down into hell, you're there. No, I can't go anywhere and get away from you. God's always with you. That's true, that's true. But in this passage, do you know why? The Apostle Paul says, I'll never leave, that Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake thee. He's saying, saying, you need to remember that so you can be content. It's actually talking about contentment. And did you notice how in the United States of America, we tend to take verses about contentment and change the meaning to mean something different? I wonder why that is. I wonder if it's because in the United States of America, we love money and we really struggle to be content. So it's much more convenient to take the Bible and twist it to mean something different. So I don't have to be reminded to be content. And again, like I said, it's not wrong to use it just to comfort yourself. I do too. But folks, it says, be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you never save you. You know why you can be content? Because even if you don't have very much, if God has promised to never leave you or forsake you, you know he's going to take care of you and you're going to be okay. So maturity is being content. And then last of all is this. Maturity is being gentle with those who are weak. And folks, this is important. Maturity is being gentle with those who are weak. Up until this point, a lot of this is more an attitude you have in yourself. But folks, this last one is, it's so important because you know a lot of times as Christians, we will view ourselves as mature. And we can get to a point in our lives where we are doing things in a way where when we evaluate our own life, for example, we'll take the Word of God and we'll memorize it. And we'll go through all the teachings of the Bible about how a Christian should live, and how a Christian should think, and, and the choices. And we can get to a point where we've got a lot of Bible knowledge. We've got a lot of confidence, and we've been Christians for many years. And we actually can view ourselves as being content. As being content. We can view ourselves as being mature, but there's one more thing that we need to add to our checklist for maturity. And that is, if you're mature, how do you treat those who aren't mature? Because if we're not careful, 
that last one will actually prove we're immature. Because we think we're mature, but when wherever we come into contact with a Christian who's not mature, we're hard on them, and we're not patient with them, and we're not gentle with those who are weak. And that last check thing on the checklist of what is maturity is how do you treat people who aren't mature? And I'll give you an example of this. You could look at a 25-year-old man, let's say, who's got a job, works hard, has a house, a car, provides for his family, does all these things, right? You could have that, someone, and we would look at that person, hardworking, honest citizen, maybe even has money in a 401k, in control of his life, paying all his bills, a responsible adult, punches in, shows up for work every day at his job, and we would look at that person and go, here's a mature person. But if he came home, and he had a little two-year-old boy, and he was mean to his two-year-old boy because his two-year-old boy couldn't do a lot of the things he could do, would you think that man was mature? No. You would go, oh yeah, he looks mature. He's so competent, but he's not gentle with the weak, and therefore he's really not mature. Because folks, maturity is not just about everything that you do. Maturity is about the way you treat other people. And we see this maturity in Jacob. Because what does Jacob say in verses 13 and 14? It says this, he said unto him, My Lord knoweth, listen to this, the children are ten. And the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on soft. According as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord and to see them. Do you know what Jacob learned in those 20 years? That there are people who are weaker and they need help. Maturity is being gentle with those who are weak. You know, as I was doing a study on the fruit of the Spirit, I'm teaching that last year, and I was going down the list of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, one of the fruit of the Spirit that I looked at, and I went, I think this is kind of neglected. We have the love, joy, peace, love, joy, peace. And this one's neglected. Meekness is another one's neglected, but I won't go there because that'll be another sermon. But it's interesting, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and such there is no law. And I thought, you know, gentleness is really neglected as a fruit of the Spirit. Maturity is being gentle with those who are weak. There's a lot in the Bible about gentleness, and gentleness is not really emphasized very often in churches today. 2 Corinthians 10.1, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Do you know that Jesus Christ was gentle? And by the way, there is a difference between gentleness and meekness. It's gentleness is a distinct thing from meekness. Um, but I want to talk about that's another message. 1 Thessalonians 2.7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. That's Paul talking about how he treated younger Christians, younger believers in Thessalonica. 2 Timothy 2.24, the Apostle Paul is giving instruction to a young pastor in Ephesus named Timothy. And here's what he says. But, um, it says, And a servant of the Lord must not strive, or basically argue, and debate with people. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient. Gentleness is very important. And when we're not gentle with those who are weak, we're not gentle with those who struggle, with those who have difficulties, with those who are not as mature as us, we're really not even mature. Even though we like to think, well, I'm really mature. I have all this Bible knowledge. I'm really mature. I have all this activity I do for God. I have all these years of serving God. No, we're not mature if we're not gentle with those who are weak. And by the way, there was a point in our life where we were weak and other people were gentle with us. And we got to remember that. Oh, yeah. Parents were gentle when I was young and immature, and my pastor was gentle with me when I was in the group. Well, I got to be gentle with these and other believers and these people who struggle. Titus 3, 1 through 3, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And then he says this, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You hear what he says? He says, you need to remember that you used to be exactly like that person that you're impatient with and frustrated with today. And that's true. Every single one of us, we had a time in our lives where we were immature. And so when we 
are growing in our maturity and becoming more like Christ, we have to see his gentleness with sinners, his gentleness with people who struggle with learning mature. And then last of all, James 3, 17 through 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace and come and make peace. So I just want to ask a question in closing. How does your life compare to this description of maturity? Are there any areas you need to work on? You know, these areas I need to work on. Humble yourself. Attribute success to God. Make things right with people. Be a giver, not a receiver. Be content. And last but not least, be gentle with those who are weak. Jacob said, I will lead on softly. The children are tender. I will lead on softly. May God make all of us here at Bells Baptist Church mature believers. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this reminder from your word. Father, I pray that you will make us, just like you made Jacob, into a mature believer. That you will make us into mature Christians who are conformed to the image of your Son. In, Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.